We often wish that we had a lot more time in a day. Maybe you're busy with a lot of things to do, and if you just had another hour or two, you could get accomplished the things that you want to accomplish. Or maybe you're having a good time with your friends and family at some, uh, some kind of celebration or get-together or game night or whatever it is, and if you just had a few extra hours, you could uh, continue to enjoy that time. Or maybe there is something that you are dreading the next day. And if you could just put a few more hours, like two, three, or a million hours between now and when you have to face that situation, it would all be well and good. But no matter how much we might long for it, or no matter how much dread fills our heart, there is absolutely no way that we can add a single second to the day. Well, there is that one time of the year when we fall back and we add an extra hour uh, to the day. Uh, We we have one day that's 25 hours, which is really stupid because we had a day before that was 23 hours. You know, you cut off from one end, you sew it on the other end, and it just, it's the same, it's weird. I hate daylight savings times. I wish we would end it because it just messes up my sleep cycle, which is already erratic to begin with. So if we just, okay, talk to your politicians and the president, whoever, let's stop it. That's the only way that we can add an hour a day is to cut it off from some other day and add it to it. There is no way that we can extend the length of a day. Now, we'll we'll ignore the fact that the Earth's rotation is slightly slowing ever so, so slightly, and, and our days are just milliseconds getting longer each and every year. But besides that, there is nothing that we can do to add time to the day. But let's, let's go into the land of make-believe, um, and let's imagine if we could add an hour, two, or ten to our day. What do you think we would do with that extra time? Did I hear somebody say sleep? That would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, well, some of y'all would sleep. Some of y'all, well, some of us... Uh, would watch more TV shows, sports, or movies. Uh, if, if the day was long enough, you could watch all the Star Wars movies that have been put out um, all together. That would be really awesome. There's just not enough day for that type of thing anymore. Or maybe you would, uh, like, like some kids here, would uh, play uh, Minecraft or Call of Duty or Candy Crush for hours, for additional hours. Some of y'all would, would uh, binge out on more YouTube videos or consume all that so pleasant Facebook gossip. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you would use that opportunity to work more because you're a workaholic and you can't just stop. Now, why would we do that with this extra time? And that would seem so wasteful. Why would we do that? Because that's what we already do with our time. We would just take the time that we have and we would multiply it. Paulus, you really should stop that. Um, you should, we would take the time, that, how we use our time now, and it would just flow into how we um, it would use our extra time. There would be no difference. We would waste it just the same. And so that begs the question, are we using t- our time as wisely as we should? Do we even consider how much time we are investing in the kingdom of Jesus so that he can bring multiplication like he desires? Now, if you were here, if you were the the brave ones, um, i.e. stupid ones, who came despite the bad road conditions and all, I'm just joking. Um, If you're one of those people who showed up last week despite the cold and the road conditions, uh, you uh, were here... And you realize that we began this series called Multiply. And so for those of you who weren't here, let's get you caught up. Uh, We're we're talking about this idea that God has entrusted his kingdom, Jesus has entrusted his kingdom to us to manage, to take care of, and to multiply. And that fits in with the uh, Great Commission to go out and make disciples of all nations. But it's not just about numbers, it's about growth and, and health and making Um, making this a healthy body, and not just here, but the church as a whole. He has entrusted us to us to, uh, to care for, and he anticipates us to multiply, to invest in order to bring multiplication. And that covers everything he has given to us, including our time. But I think time is one of the things that we shortchange God the most. 
It is the resource that is, quite frankly, the most valuable resource that we have. Time is more important to us than our money. It is a lot easier to drop a check in an offering plate than it is to spend two or three or four hours doing the things that we might need to do. It is far easier to give of our finances than to give of our time because it is so limited. We have, we have so little of it, and everything <coughs> demands our time. So we need to think about how much time are we investing in the kingdom of God? How much time are we spending with God in, in prayer and studying his word? How much time are we spending teaching our kids about Jesus, even using everyday circumstances of, of life, as even if, if we're playing something stupid like Minecraft together? You know, are we using that to teach them about Jesus? Are we serving God? Are we serving one another? Are we serving the church? Are we spending and investing our time wisely? So today we're going to be looking at a passage from Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 15 through 21. And in this, Paul is going to challenge us in our use of the time that God has given us. So we're going to walk through it and uh, we're going to make, hopefully, the bulk of our application towards the end. We're going to try to get through this as quickly as we can not skimping out on what we should learn from it. Uh, Paul says, pay careful attention then how, uh, to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So he is setting up this, this contrast that we know and we experience in everyday life, that uh, in this life there is a struggle between doing good and doing evil. We know that we ought to do good, but there, there is a draw on our, on our bodies, on our minds, on our souls to do evil. It is part of the sinful nature that we are battling each and every day. And so we are, we are at a conflict quite often um, whether or not we are going to please God or we're going to please ourselves or, or to do something sinful and evil. So in light of that contrast, Paul is, is challenging us. He's calling us to, uh, to be wise people who live in a way that we glorify God, that we don't follow the sinful ways of the world, but we follow his ways and live according to his wisdom that he has given to us. And in part of doing that is how we use our time. He says, make the, the most of your time. Use it for something good, not something, uh, not for evil. Not, don't use, waste your time on doing uh, sinful, evil, wicked things, but use it to do things that please God. So living wisely includes how we use our time. Because if we are not careful, our time will get sucked away from us very quickly. There are things that distract us, um, from things that are e eternally important. And some things aren't necessarily bad, but if we spend too much time on it, then that takes away time that we can be doing things that are a lot more important. So we can get easily distracted or get in and sucked into things that take our time. Like maybe you sit down on the couch and you're like, I need to unwind for a little bit. I'm going to uh, turn on Netflix or I'm going to uh, turn on, on a channel and I'm going to watch a movie or I'll watch a TV show. And like 10 hours later, when you finally are done binge watching that show or watching that movie marathon, you, you feel like a zombie. Like, I don't know if any of y'all have been there. Um, or maybe there's a, a video game that's designed for kids that you get sucked into and you just can't stop playing. Like I am guilty of that recently. The kids have been really getting into playing Minecraft, which is a really um, basic but simple game. You, look, you got to even got literature about it. But it is such an addictive game because you're just going around mining, mining and trying to build things, and it's, 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 it's addictive. So don't start, okay? Let me tell you that. It will mess with your sleep habits. Um, or maybe you just get sucked into watching hours and hours of Sports Center. We don't have ESPN, so we can't do that. Um, I mean, you watch the same plays over and over again. It didn't change. It's not going to change. It's not going to be any different. The guy's still going to miss that basket. Or maybe there's that soul sucker called Facebook. 
You go on there and you want to see how so-and-so is doing. There's, maybe they're, they're sick and you want to see if they posted an update about their health uh, or maybe you want to check some pictures of your grandkids. And before you know it, uh, you've commented on 10 friends' uh, posts, you've watched 87 cat videos, and you've gotten into three political debates. You just wanted to check on how that one person was doing. But we can also use our time for good, like serving, learning from God's word, growing in our faith, making sure that we are taking care of ourselves spiritually, emotionally, physically, that we're taking care of our families, that we're sharing our faith, that we're using our hands for those of us who are working age to earn a living. There are good uses for our time, and so we need to be wise and careful how we use it. So Paul goes on. He sets up this expectation. The world is evil. We're in the struggle to do good or not do good. And, and um, so we need to be wise in how we live, be careful to do the good thing. And that includes using our time. So in light of that, um, he goes on in verse 17. He says, so, okay, it, because of what he had just said, in light of all the things that he has said, he's going to go on and give some commands. In light of this truth, there are some things that we need to do. He's going to give us two commands. The first one is in 17 says, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So in light of this nature, the struggle, this competition for our time, don't be an idiot. For some of you, that is a challenge. <laughs> don't be an idiot. Instead, know what Jesus wants you to do and do it. So be wise and learn Jesus' will and live it out. That, is, that, t that takes time and effort and, and focus in order to do that. We've got to learn what, and know what God's will is and then put it into practice because that's part of his will. His will isn't just that we uh, become super scholars about his word. We need to know his word. But we also need to implement it because that is his will. So the first one is don't be an idiot. Know what God's will is and do it. And the second command in light of this, this fact that we need to be wise is he says don't get drunk with wine which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, don't waste your time getting drunk, or in, our, in modern day time we might say get drunk or high, which leads to bad choices. Um, and if we are not careful, abusing alcohol and other substances like it, um, if we are not careful, we become a slave to that substance, and it becomes our master. So it is a, it is a dangerous thing that should be taken uh, seriously. And we know that, that using alcohol in, in, in the wrong context uh, can lead to very bad um, consequences. It can cause a person to become violent. Um, it can make them easy to bed, if you catch my drift. We can make them lazy where they, they don't work. They just want to get drunk. It makes them sometimes lose control of their reaction. Sometimes they beat their children. Some people lose control of their vehicle and injure and kill other people. Now, this isn't the only unwise thing, unwise way of living, but this is an example that Paul is using because it was a struggle in the Roman Empire. It is, this uh, problem has been a struggle for, for a very long time. It has been such a struggle even in our own country that we erroneously tried to outlaw the substance, and that just made the problem worse through, through prohibition. So it has been a, a problem that has plagued society for a long time, um, and so it is, it is why Paul is addressing it here. Now, partying and, and all that sort of thing is not new. It's not something that American teenagers do or college students do. Yes, it's a problem on our campuses, but it's not just been isolated to America in the 2000s. It was a problem back in Roman culture and society. Uh, people um, like to spend their time getting drunk and doing stupid things. Okay, so it's nothing new under the sun. So this is just one example of how to not live a dumb way. Uh, don't, get, don't, don't waste your time getting drunk. Now, of course, there are other highs and substances that people chase after that cause similar problems. So these types of things are probably fall in this teaching as well. So we, we've got to be, be wise in how we spend our time and not doing things that are going to absolutely wreck our lives and the lives of other people. And just to illustrate what I'm talking about here, 
And, and I'm not trying to like beat a, beat a dead horse or, or get on a hobby horse about hobby horse, a, a soapbox about this, but this is just an example of Paul is using uh, yeah, a hobby horse. That would be fun. I don't know why I said that. I get off my hobby horse now. Anyhow, so there's a saying. Just We, we all know the consequences of bu- abusing alcohol and other substances. There is a phrase that is rather common in our society that it kind of has a comical tone to it, but uh, it, it underlines the, the, the issue of drinking too much. It says, um, whenever something, uh, somebody is about to do something stupid, maybe one of their friends is egging them on, or maybe they think that they can outdo somebody else, there is a saying that they usually say, hey, hold my beer. Hey, hold my beer, because I've been getting drunk, so here, hold my beer so I can go off and do something stupid. Uh, and, and that little silly um, saying, it, it just illustrates the fact that sometimes we can abuse it too much, and it, it, it messes with our judgment, and we might do something stupid as a result of that. So instead of overflowing with spirits, we are to be filled with the spirit. You see what we did there? (laughs) I'm a wordsmith. That's just funny. (laughs) Instead of overflowing with spirits, we are to be filled with, uh, to be spirit filled. Now, Paul uh, is telling us, in contrast to living uh, to get drunk, uh, we need to be filled with the spirit. We are to let the spirit move us, guide us, shape us, convict us, and all the things that the spirit does. Now, I do want to take a moment to uh, clear up some confusion what it means to be spirit-filled. Because I think there are a lot of Christians who misunderstand this concept. And there's a lot of teachers who falsely say that it is one thing that it is absolutely not. So I want you to think about what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Does it mean that a person can speak in tongues or have miraculous gifts? Or is it a... um, where you get emotional during worship. Oh, the worship was just so awesome. I felt the, the, fear just, the Spirit just filled the place. Um, is it sensing God's presence when we're gathered with other believers? Or is it when a person is really uh, gifted and, and talented with something? Oh, that person is Spirit-filled. Look at what they are doing, right? Is that what it means to be Spirit-filled? No, the answer is no, because that's not how Paul uses it. Paul is going to spend a a couple um, uh, sentences here to tell us what he means by being spirit-filled. It's not some uh, weird uh, hippie nonsense or some emotional uh, weirdness. It it is uh, something that has very concrete application to everyday life. It's, It's really not what we expect. So we're going to look at what he says and how Paul describes what it means to be filled with the Spirit. So we have a clear understanding of what it means so that we're not misusing the phrase and we can kind of figure out when people might be misusing it for other reasons. So in verse 19, he says what it means to be Spirit-filled. He says, Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. This is one way in which we, we, are, we practice being spirit-filled, where we encourage or challenge one another with various types of singing and song and poetry, uh, scripture readings. Uh, that is all kind of encompassed in these. He's using a variety of terms for uh, singing and song, which isn't necessarily singing to music always. Um, the, we, we are to encourage and challenge one another with singing. Um, and he says, uh, with your heart. This has got to be something that is genuine, something that is uh, from our heart where we, we care, and not just singing words because they're on a screen or on a page, but because they have meaning. Okay? We, we've got to understand the words that we're singing, and we, we've got to understand the message behind it and use that uh, not just as a, a way to praise God ourselves, but to challenge and encourage one another. Okay, so that's, that's the f- one, of the, one way of being filled with the Spirit. Then he says, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father, um, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So giving thanks to God for what he is giving but, and, and how he is working in our lives, whether it's good or bad. We need to give thanksgiving in all situations because there are times when we absolutely do not feel like giving thanks. 
Maybe we're in a situation that is, it is tough, that we, there, we, we can hardly even see how there's any good thing in a situation, maybe because it's an illness or a loss or some crisis that we're in. Because we're overwhelmed by the situation, we can't see any good thing that is going to happen as a result. Or on, a, on another side, maybe things are going really good. And we take for granted that God is the, the source of the goodness of our life. That uh, the, the blessings that we are experiencing or, or the peace or the ease of the, the time is because God has given it to us. It is not a product of the work of our hands, of our own doing, but it is a gift from God. Because everything ultimately that is good is from God. And the last thing that he says is submitting to one another in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. That is what it means to be spirit-filled, to submit to one another, to set aside our own wants and our own needs for the sake of others. And this isn't in a, a way that causes harm to ourselves, that, that we exert all of our resources in helping and serving others, and, and we don't take time to take care of ourselves. That's not good stewardship of ourselves. And it's not done in a codependent way, where we make people absolutely dependent on us and, and we get our satisfaction from that. But we need to make sacrifices to help um, one another. We need to help make sacrifices to help people understand who Jesus is um, in, in knowing that what Jesus has done for us. So we, we lay down our lives, we submit to one another because that is what Jesus has done for us. So, to be, to be spirit-filled... Um, we encourage one another with song, we give thanksgiving to God, and we submit and help and serve one another. So let me ask you a question. And I want you to, to try to give me an answer. In order for us to sing and encourage one another in song and scripture, in order for us to give thanks together, and in order for us to serve and submit to one another, what has to happen? We have to come together. There has to be a together aspect of that. You can't submit to one another if you're off in your living room by yourself being a complete introvert, which I, I, can, um, I, I can sympathize with that feeling. But it takes coming together to be together. I, don't, I know you, you can understand the logic of that, but it, in order for us to encourage one another, to submit to each other, and give thanks together, we have to be together. And that takes at least two things. It takes efforts, and it takes time. Yeah, it takes time. We have to spend time to be together. That is a wise investment of the time that God has given to us. And it's not about filling pews or making sure the red spaces are covered up. It's not to make sure that you are here to put your offering in the offering plates. It's not about the number of attendants in the bulletin. It's not about that. It's about making sure that we gather together to encourage, to equip, to challenge, to lift up, to minister to one another. It's, it's to be the church. Because God has called us to be a family, not just pew sitters, not just spectators, but to be a family that works together to invest and multiply the kingdom of Jesus. And that happens when we gather for worship. When we gather on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, whenever we gather, that's when this happens. But it also happens as we go about, out and about in our daily lives. Now, all of these things happen when we do things together as the family of God. So I hope that in all of this, in this passage, as Paul is teaching us to be wise, part of that is how we use our time. And he's given us uh, some, uh, some guidelines for how to use our time wisely. Submitting and, and, and serving and encouraging and giving thanks. And, and that's very much corporate worship language. That is a strong investment of our time because it's not just uh, to, to, f to fill a, a, a building, but it's to minister and to help one another 
in our journey of faith. So I want you guys to invest time in Jesus' kingdom. I, that's not what I want. That's what Jesus wants. Invest your time in Jesus' kingdom. And just to kind of to close off, uh, I want to give you guys a visual illustration of what we're talking about. Now, we opened up thinking about all, all the, the things that, that suck up our time. Uh, there's a, we wish we had more time often. There are so many things that fill our time. Some things are good. And some things are not good. Some things are wise and some things are just plain foolish. So I want to I illustrate this. Uh, this is a piece of string which represents one day. Each inch represents one hour. So this is a typical day in the life of a Christian. Imagine if you sit down and you spend a half an hour of time uh, reading your Bible, praying, or maybe 15 minutes. Um, a half an hour is, I don't know if y'all can see that, that little, that little orange piece of tape. That is what it looks like to give God some time of your day to study his word, to know what his will is so that you can do it. That was a part of the passage. And, and prayer. Just that little bit in comparison to the rest of it. Because that's, that's one day. If we can invest just that little bit, uh, that, that makes a world of difference. But let me show you also what a week looks like. This is a week's worth of string. Now this here... This is if you add up all those, uh, all that time that you're investing um, in growing your relationship with God, learning from his word, and, and living out his word, half an hour, um, that, that's what it looks like in a week, okay? And this is what it, where is it? This is what it looks like to spend an hour worshiping with fellow Christians. Don't, don't lose sight of that piece of tape. In all of this, one hour is what that looks like. Now imagine, though, in this week, how much time you, you do uh, spend on Facebook or watching Sports Center or binging on Netflix compared to the one hour. But think about, though, uh, and that's, that's an ideal situation. Some of you are really good, and this, little, uh, this is a little bit wider because you come for Sunday school, too. And so that would be two inches long. But still, compared to the rest of it, that's really that's not a whole lot compared to uh, all of this. That's a good investment. And all of this time that you're spending doing so many other things, that is a very excellent investment. But the truth is, uh, in, in America, the average church attendance is really, um, to round it up, it's two times, two Sundays a month. The, the average is actually 1.4 times a month. And this isn't counting times when you're sick or when you can't come to church because of the weather. This is just coming to church to worship with other Christians. And of course, worship isn't everything. That's not the entire Christian life. That's not everything for what it means to be a Christian, but it's, it's important to worship together. So in reality, this is not really what it looks like. So I want to give you guys a, a vision of what it looks like for our time. Okay, that's, that's, this is a day. This is how much time we have in a day. This is how much time we have in a week. Let me show you how much time we have available in a month. So just sit there. This is going to take a few seconds to do because this is an awful lot of time. And just be thankful I wasn't dumb enough to do this for a year. Okay, that would have been... Um, <laughs> I couldn't find rope or string enough long enough for that. Okay, so this is what it looks like in order. This is all the time that we have available to us in a month. Now, guys, watch your heads. If you notice all the time that you could be spending, if you spend half an hour of your time uh, with Jesus, it's all the way back there. Okay, look how small that is. That's, um, th that's all the time spending in Bible study and prayer. Sorry, guys. Um, let me see if I can loop it around here to not to cut it right. All right, there we go. So... Don't even try to hang me. Okay. <laughs> this, all the way to the, to the front door. This is a month's worth of time. Let me show you what two Sundays, two hours for worship a month looks like. Okay. Compared to all of this, that right there 
I think is, and you might say, well, Joe, you get paid to come here on Sunday. Even when we're on vacation, we're going to church somewhere. Um, this is what it looks like. On average, for the, the average church attender in America, and it's getting worse. The real average attendance is really one time in a month. Um, because people are, um, in, in, they're, going, they're knocking off and, and going on trips all the time because gas is cheap and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's what it's looking like. So that's not a whole lot of time invested in the kingdom of God. In a month. Now do this 52, or not 52, that, what am I thinking? Do that 12 more times. So that's not a whole lot of time that is being invested in, in our walk with God and in the kingdom of heaven. So I want to ask you, I want to challenge you to invest more time in the kingdom of God. And I used to think, I used to be a lot more shy about um, saying, hey, you need to be stepping up, investing more time with, in the kingdom, doing, investing more time in the church, because I have been concerned that, that people sometimes spend too much time doing things for congregations and not enough time doing outreach, um, or, or, or I feel bad for giving that burden on people. Like, you know, we need some help for, for some things. And, and I know you're already busy. I feel bad for adding on top of that. But I know that there are so many of you who spend hours, um, and, and, which is okay, hours in, in a week, like with Lions Club, or you're, you're coaching sports, or you're helping out with, with your school, which are all good things. But what's more important? Jesus is obviously more important. His kingdom is more important. It has eternal significance. So if we could just invest more time in the kingdom of God and make that a priority, that would be awesome. Because our time is not very much, and we need to be using it wisely. So this is what I'm asking for you guys to do. I'm going to be bold in asking and, 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 and challenging you to invest uh, your time wisely. Uh, spend some time with God in Bible study and prayer in a week. You know? Grow in your faith and relationship with him. On top of that, I'm asking, uh, this is almost representative of how much time I'm asking from you. I challenge you to invest a time, an hour a week worshiping with fellow Christians, what we do here on Sunday morning. Make it a priority. Some of you, uh, will, and this is understandable, will not miss one of your child's or your grandchildren's sports games for, the, for, for nothing. You will be at every single game if you, if you can, unless the weather is bad or if you have to work for some reason. Make church the same priority. Not, not just church, but gathering to encourage one another. I also challenge you to invest an hour a week of spending time with other Christians and studying the Bible in Sunday school or, or Wednesday night, or if your schedule is weird because of work and, and you wanna, want us to invent some weird, crazy time like uh, Bible study at two in the afternoon, I don't, you know, we can be flexible and creative and try new things. We're not opposed to that. So, but I challenge us to, to really set aside some time to, um, to gathering for the, the purpose of studying God's word together. I also challenge you to give it an hour a week serving Getting plugged into some kind of a, a ministry here, which a lot of you guys already do things around here, and that is awesome. Um, but invest some time into serving because that is one of the wise uses of time that we talked about um, from the passage today. And, and another hour, I ask some time. Uh, maybe it's not an hour. Maybe it's half an hour. Maybe it's uh, whatever. Uh, spend some time outside of Bible study and church getting to know and building relationships with other Christians, especially Christians from our congregation, and or build relationships with non-Christians and spend time with them so that you can bring them to Jesus. And you know, that can, that can be spread out over time, and, and, and that can be done over lunch, or it can be while you're working, or maybe as you're uh, doing sports, or whatever it is. You can, you can um, use what you're already doing, and invite people along uh, with you on that journey. So really, that one's not, that's just using what you're already you're doing uh, to build relationships with other people uh, for the sake of Jesus. So really, that's, that's just a little bit of time in a week. So, our time is, is really short, and we need to be using it wisely. 
I want to close with a, some words from Psalm 34. This psalm is often used in funeral services because it helps the living understand the need to use our time well. The writer of the psalm says, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long, and my lifespan is as nothing to you. Yes, every human being stands as only a vapor. So life is short. The inches, the hours, the days, and the years go by so very quickly. But when we use them and invest them wisely in the kingdom of God, the investment is something that the results continue to multiply for eternity. So let's use our time wisely. Let's invest it in Jesus' kingdom where the results will be eternal.